Okay, so uh, today we are going to talk again about uh, uh, environmental issues. In the previous lecture, I made a difference between sociology of environment and environmental sociology by saying that in sociology of environment, environment is the dependent variable and sociology or social structure is the independent variable. So, sociology of environment uh, looks at uh, relationship between structural or biographic factors on the one hand as independent or causal variables, environmental degradation, climate change, environmental consciousness, ecological beliefs etcetera as dependent variable. In environmental sociology, the relationship is just reverse of that. In environmental sociology, social structure, social consciousness, one term superego is the dependent variable and geographical, environmental, ecological variables are independent variables. I also mentioned about uh, two demographers who are also uh, sociologists like Kingsley Davis and Nathan K. Fitz showed the connection between population variables and develop, development and environmental variables, how it is uh, important now to look at the relationship between population and environment why is it important to talk about environmental issues, sustainable development. And today, I will talk about differences in perception regarding environmental issues between developed and developing countries, which has become a major bone of contention in the recent past. Why do developed and developing countries have different approaches, visions, strategies and compulsions? to deal with environmental issues, the issue of climate change that is the subject matter of today's discussion. Now, it is obvious um, all those who have read anything about Kyoto protocol know that there are serious differences in perception of sustainable development between developed and developing countries. Developed countries uh, mostly led by United States and developing countries led mostly by India and China. There is a US policy, there is another policy advocated by India and China. Other countries are in between, mostly developed countries are European countries are mostly with United States and Latin American African countries are mostly supporting Indian and Chinese position on development and environment. Why is the difference? Now, when it comes to perception of developed countries, you find certain common elements in perception of United States, Europe, Japan, other developed countries which are high in income, industrialization, urbanization. The first thing is that for them, environmental problems are the most serious issues facing mankind. So, for all the issues, this is not the only issue, there are so many issues of concern you have population issues, social conflicts, anomy, violence, terrorism, trafficking of women and children, inequality, migration, there are so many issues. But from the perspective of developed countries when it comes to development, then environmental problems are seen as the most serious issues facing not only developed countries, but the whole mankind. Global, there is a global risk of water, air and noise pollution. This risk is global. Huh? It is not confined to any particular country. It is not confined to US or to Denmark or New Zealand. It is global. Risk of water, air and noise pollution are global risk. We have witnessed acid rains uh, the result of unsustainable development or uh, excesses of industrialization, mechanization, manufacturing. Even in countries contributing least to environmental damage, there are countries which are not so high in industrialization, which have plenty of forests, which are trying to promote organic farming and agro based economy, but still they are suffering from acid rains. 
due to environmental pollution caused by neighboring countries. So, th in that sense the risk of uh, environmental pollution or climate change are global. They are no more confined only to those countries which are creating environmental problems. Environmental problems are the most serious of all the problems facing mankind and they are of global nature. That means, uh, from their perspective even if environmental problems are created in Africa, it should be everybody's concern. It should be concern of US, it should be concern of Latin America, it should be of concern to India. And these environmental pro problems are now affecting growth of industry and agriculture worldwide, because they are destructive of environment, nature, they have polluted rivers, they have polluted air. Therefore, even agricultural production worldwide is affected by them. Climate change, this is leading to climate change. Studies have shown that during last 100 years or so, uh, the world temperature has been rising. And there is a real danger that if the world temperature rises further by 2 degree, this will be highly destructive of populations living in the coastal areas and maybe some small island countries will even be submerged in the ocean. So, the, the danger is real. This uh, environmental destruction or climate change is also leading to displacement of people from one part of the country to another and from one country to other countries. And in that sense is a cause of human tragedy. This human tragedy also arises because uh, due to population pressure, people have started living in those areas which were unlivable for a long period of time. So, when there is uh, population surplus, people have a tendency to fell forests, to live in the coastal areas, to live in hilly areas and to and along with modernization desire to have modern amenities and construct houses of the modern type everywhere they live. They create buildings, infrastructure, roads basically those situations where it is not uh, sustainable to construct those types of buildings or roads or infrastructure or establish industry. So, that is uh, adding to our problems of living. The causes are unrestricted growth of population in the developing countries. I am not saying from my side that behind environmental problem population factor is the biggest factor. I am just saying that from the perspective of developed countries, this is the case or what the developed countries want us to believe in is that environmental problems are global, serious, causing human tragedies, displacement and one of the most important causes of this is unrestricted growth of population in the developing countries. Developed countries are not having, we have seen the data, the developed countries are not having um, significant population growth, some of them are even having negative growth. Then rising aspirations, a few months ago there was a big debate on whether Asians are eating more, Indians are eating more, because some thought leader in United States made a comment that many problems of the world are caused because Indians have started eating more. So, so, from their perspective there is rising aspirations and rapid industrialization in developing countries. If the developing countries are willing to live at the same level of development at which they have been living for thousands of years, then there will be no or there will be very little of environmental destruction. Now, this rapid population growth, rising aspirations and industrialization in developing countries are leading to felling of trees, modernization, more requirement of energy and spread of consumerism. Also in the developing countries, environmental laws either they do not exist or they are very weakly enforced. As such, most of the developing countries are corrupt, lack transparency, governance and are soft states. And when it comes to environmental laws particularly, then nobody bothers. 
neither government bothers and nor people corruption underhand dealings uh, lobbies of industrialists lobbies of businessmen uh, ensure that uh, in the developing countries interests of the business houses are maintained interests of business houses are protected irrespective of their consequence for the environment so there is weak enforcement of laws due to corruption governments are weak and there is generally a lack of environmental consciousness people are people also do not have that environmental consciousness because of which or with which they can force the state or industries yes we are talking about developing countries over here or developed countries from the i am talking about the perspective of the developed countries what they think about developing countries what they think so uh, but these characteristics are very much found in uh, the developed countries as well so are they overlooking their own uh, what they have actually from our perspective developed countries want to place blame for environmental uh, or climatic change mm-hmm. on processes in the developing countries though they may be the uh, though as we will see later that they are the major the polluters yeah. hmm. they are the major polluters but they would like the world to believe that the responsibility for um, all the degradation is due preventing to further degradation mm. lies with less developed countries to some extent this is also true that these characteristics weak env- environment laws corruption weak governments lack of environmental consciousness they universal. particularly apply to developing country mm. this is true that an average citizen of germany is much more conscious of environment than an average citizen of india that is a fact and as the report of uh, transparency international shows india is one of the most corrupt countries of the world that is also true you know, it let us not go exactly by numbers whether india's position on corruption scale should be this or that but the fact remains that india is one of the most corrupt countries so i would like to uh, not argue but comment over here that corruption caught is corruption if where they like if they can't uh, point out the corruption in some countries so they will not count them as corrupt but since in india it's so much uh, visible so they uh, number it uh, as one of the most corrupt nations though it may not be so in yeah, uh, reality these are the issues on which we cannot definitely talk in terms of objective indicators yeah. but uh, if you read the methodology developed by transparency international mm-hmm. uh, they have used quite an objective method for arriving at scores of corruption uh, and various dimensions of corruption based on quite well standardized methodologies from both statistical point of view and also from the point of view of reliability of data this seems to be a fact it doesn't sound good to the ears being an indian uh, it's bad to hear for people like us for intellectuals of developing countries it hurts our sentiment but this is a fact this is a fact that in that uh, some of the developing countries are also some of the most corrupt countries now the perception of developing countries how do developing countries perceive about this the developing countries want to catch up with the developed countries for them environmental issues population issues or other issues are secondary the most important issue the most important value the most important goal for developing countries is to catch up with the developed countries and there is no ideological or political or party conflict over this whether in our country like whether bjp or congress anybody comes to power any party they would like to fix a higher goal growth of income per capita for the country development first because from our perspective we are already, we are so poor and also there is no justification why should we not catch up with the western countries why should we not there is no satisfactory answer to the question why should we not be as developed as people in the developed countries why should we not have air conditioners why should we not have the latest technology in computing 
why should we not have atom bombs and nuclear bombs why should we not have uh, uh, malls or uh, why should we not uh, fly by uh, best of aircraft so there is no for developing countries uh, the catching up with the western countries catching up with the developed countries is of the uh, top most importance they too have right to have a high standard of living as in the west all political leaders will say Samajwadi Party, BJP, Congress, all leaders will say. The very talk of environmental problems is essentially from their perspective an instrument of debarring them means debarring developing countries from raising their standard of living to the levels of developed countries. They say developing countries say that uh, these developed countries are talking of environmental problems. Uh, and putting the environmental question in such a manner that they want to debar us from the benefits of uh, latest technology and latest development. Developing countries like India feel that for them poverty rather than over development is the cause of environmental problems and in all less developed countries more or less this is the situation and this is the position. I am quoting from a 5 year plan draft 1985 government of India that with the realization that poverty and the state of underdevelopment led to many of the environmental problems that confronted the nation came the understanding that it was more rapid development that was the best approach that if you want to counter environmental problems in our country then you have to develop fast. So, this is just reverse of what the developed countries are saying. For from the perspective of development, from the perspective of development of the developed countries, there is a need to be cautious regarding setting up goals regarding uh, per capita income. From the perspective of developing countries like India, uh, poverty is the biggest cause of environmental problems in our country. In order to counter the environmental problems in our country, rapid development is the answer. Further this development has to benefit people and particularly the poor by providing for their basic human needs and rising aspirations. Thus, many of the developmental programs could indeed be termed as environmental management programs. This is the difference. So, for us developmental programs are the environmental management programs. For developed countries, there is a need to draw a line on development processes. From the perspective of developing countries, more development, further development, rapid development and poverty removal would protect. As far as the reality is concerned, in the period 1900 to 2004, in 104 years period, the whole of Africa was responsible for 2.5 percent of cumulative carbon dioxide emissions while the US accounted for 29.5 percent. So, uh, what you said is correct that if you look at the statistics of carbon emission or other indicators of environmental degradation, then the biggest polluters are developed countries themselves. India's current per capita carbon dioxide emissions are 1.5 tons per annum against 20 tons in the United States. That means, if you really have a global perspective, then the interventions in the field of environment must be made first in the United States, where in per capita terms they are producing emission of 20 tons. In our country, emissions are only 1.5 tons. Now, other factors remaining same, if our income doubles and all other factors remain same, if our population doubles or uh, suppose both population and development double. So, our uh, emission per capita would be 1.5 into 4, 6, even then it will be less than one third of what is happening in the United States today. But United States is saying that for the global interests of the world, for uh, environmental interests of the world for climate change, developmental activities 
in less developed countries must be restrained because they can't think of going back you know it's not possible for united states to to think in terms of reducing their per capita income there is actually a need for climate justice firstly the richer countries should repay their climate debt by undertaking severe cuts in emissions reserving atmospheric space for the growing emissions of poorer countries from justice point of view if you compare situation in developed and developing countries an objective if you take an objective dispassionate view of the situation and not identify with interest of anyone developed or developing countries the justice would demand that the developed countries should reduce their economic standards and the less developed countries should be allowed to pollute maybe for some more time so that once both of them reach some kind of parity in development and technological standards then you can blame uh, both of them equally or you can uh, give your lectures on environment with equal effectiveness to both secondly that financial compensation should assist both uh, or uh, with the cost of low carbon transition and of adaptation to the damaging effects of climate change that means if you want developing countries to reduce their damaging effect then they be, they require better technology and they require certain kinds of intersectoral shifts in economy which will require money but less developed countries do not have money for that so the developed countries must provide financial compensation and financial help to developing countries uh, to go for latest technology which is environment saving it has to be understood clearly that sustainable development is however not a strategy of development it is a goal or a vision to be of practical utility it has to be operationalized in a specific context and the contexts are different it sensitizes us to the fact that the rich and the poor the present and the future cities and countryside industry and agriculture and man and nature are inseparable and they are linked with each other through complex socio economic cultural biological and political chains and the concept of sustainable development stresses that the long run welfare of a community depends heavily on the quality of surrounding environment and welfare of the other community you cannot live your life in isolation today so for sustainable development everybody is equally responsible that is true but before you make everybody equally responsible you have to bring everybody at the same level if everybody is not at par in socio economic technological uh, educational standards how can you blame the poor people more this is what the developed countries are doing so the issue is what are all the strategies possible if a country wants to go for sustainable development world bank suggests a three fold strategy for meeting the challenges of sustainable development and they are build on positive links which means that growth of income promotes efficient use of resources technology transfer market and investment in environmental improvement poverty removal reduces population growth and provides resources and knowledge to enable the poor to take a long range view of development poor people cannot take a long run view of development they cannot afford so you have heard about uh, this copenhagen climate change conference 2009 people say that it failed it was held in december and the top leaders of different nations talked over sorting out the issues which were mainly responsible for the increase in level of co2 gas leading to global warming and melting of glaciers ice and snow there was an agreement effort should be made so that the uh, global temperature does not rise beyond 2% uh, sorry 2 uh, 2 degree centigrade excessive dependence of countries on non renewable resources of energy like coal and petroleum increasing population industrial revolution burning of fossil fuels etc were considered the chief reasons which have given birth 
to global warming and it failed. The regions, uh, the re uh, all the regions that you find in literature, in media, why, the, why this failed are zero sum game. Uh, between developed and developing countries, it has become a zero sum game. And both of them think that gains of others are losses of theirs. So, if, if developed countries are asked to maintain restraint, then developing countries are permitted to pollute more, they can grow more, they can go for uh, a higher rate of growth of income. If the less developed countries are restrained and their freedom to go for higher rate of growth of income is curtailed, then the developed countries can maintain their present day standards. So, there is a zero sum game, gain of one loss of another. Second thing some people say this Copenhagen gave exclusive rights to decide about environmental matters to national governments and national governments obviously, uh, in liberal democracies with uh, their vote banks in mind uh, will maintain the interest of the nations first. The issue is global right in the beginning we saw that the environmental issues are global everybody recognizes that the issues are global, but once you give exclusive rights to national governments and uh, they are not able to go beyond the political interests of the nation. In the zero sum game perspective, they are not able to uh, come up with decisions which they can, uh, which they are happy with uh, to take and which they can readily enforce. There was a neglect of business, civil society, cities and the youth just to name a few then old style negotiation techniques. There should have been much more diplomacy, much more uh, homework, involvement of environmental networks, civil society, media. Uh, some better solution could have come, but uh, this did not happen. The structure of the world order is not designed to solve environmental problems that no, no, uh, that no national boundary. Environmental problems have no national boundary, but political interests have national boundaries and there are outmoded ways of doing global governance. Uh, United may be some change is required in the composition and structure of United Nations or international organizations of that type. Now, we are hoping that something in November this year, the governments are again meeting to talk about Copenhagen failure and develop a new process for climate change soon uh, in November 2010. The UN Secretariat is working very, very closely with the Mexican government to form a team with it, which would be talking, which would be taking on the political leadership role during negotiations at Cancun. So, this is the situation, difference in perspectives between developed and developing countries. Now, let us talk a little bit about population and sustainable development, because this finally, this course is on population. So, population size and demographic processes are intricately linked with sustainable development, though population is not the only source of environmental crisis that we know. There is technology, there is social structure, there is culture, there are aspirations, there are political institutions, movements, social movements, neo social movements all those things affect environmental consciousness, environmental beliefs and environmental action, but population size is one of the important factors. High rate of growth of population not only raises the demand for natural resources, it also affects most of those proximate variables, which hamper the sustainability of development. For example, organization of production, innovations, technological developments, politics, values and market forces. Population processes also affect the other indicators of sustainability such as equality, justice, absence of abject poverty and greater participation of people in development. In the less developed countries where population growth rates are high and particularly in those countries where density of population is also high, the possibility of raising carrying capacities of scarce land resources is low and the alternative employment opportunities 
are limited, people would be forced to exploit natural resources without regard for future. In the tribal areas, we can see this very clearly. Here people are forced to expand agricultural lands into unsuited areas, enlarge the size of their herds of livestock and out migrate to other areas quite often causing the problem of what we commonly call the problem of commons. Ironically, the less developed countries also have low carrying capacity that is the social developmental and institutional variables that underpin the ability of institutions to cope with environmental stress. There are multiple effects of population growth however, population growth leads to fragmentation of land, causes low productivity, unemployment and reduced supply of fodder. People may respond to low farm productivity by increasing the number of livestock. Then the agricultural expansion and growth of livestock destroy the forests and pastures. They also cause soil erosion and thus ecological imbalance. As a matter of fact, population growth, poor economic condition, deforestation, soil desiccation and ecological imbalance tend to reinforce each other through dynamic multicyclic structures. According to Demini, Paul Demini, a significant change in the demographic parameters is found to cause shifts in relationships between population, income and resource use intensity, sometimes compensating and sometimes reinforcing the environmental impact. To quote, uh, in particular over time non-linearities to scale may appear, quantitative increases can generate qualitative changes, thresholds separating for example, tolerable levels of pollution from levels that generate unacceptable risk for human health may be crossed. Up to a certain level damage to a renewable resource such as a forest ecosystem may be corrected by a spontaneous and relatively rapid biological process. Beyond that level the damage may be irreparable or the natural recovery or the human engineered repair of the eco ecosystem in question may require a very long time or entail exorbitant cost. So, there are complex and diverse issues. In simple language, the relationship between population and environment is not amenable to one simple formulation. Population dynamics may offset or catalyze the effect of population size on environment. It depends on a number of socio-economic, political, cultural, technological and environmental factors. It also depends on whether we are focusing at micro level or macro level. So, the environmental impact of uh, uh, population growth um, has to be seen separately at individual level, household level, village level, community level, state level or regional level and the national and international level. The effects are not same. Imagine that due to increase in family size, just to give an example of how uh, people take different types of actions uh, in different situations. Imagine that due to increase in family size in moderate fertility context, uh, moderate fertility context family size increases due to reduction in mortality. There is a division of land and in per capita term the family becomes poorer. What does the family do? The family may respond by increasing fertility. Increasing fertility is the cause of becoming poor but the family may respond by increasing fertility with the aim of diversification of economic activities and benefiting from division of labor and offset the negative effect of population growth on development and leading further to environmental problems or to, uh, to poverty or degradation or division of land. The family may increase fertility without having the possibility of raising income and the negative impact of population may be reinforced. In the same way, there are different possibilities for societies and nations. In absence of capital, they may decide. So, no wonder you can certainly find some countries where uh, population growth rate is high. The process of economic development, industrialization, rising aspirations, modernization are highly destructive of environmental quality and still those countries are maintaining the policy 
of uh, increasing population growth or not bothering about population growth or not having policies to reduce their growth rate of population of fertility. In absence of capital they may decide families, uh, communities as well as nations may decide to substitute capital by labor and thus ignore or encourage high fertility. They may benefit from this strategy in the short run and for them those who have, those who have been poor and deprived of modern day facilities the short run is more important than the long run. They may simply increase fertility due to religious, cultural, political or economic reasons then they suffer more. Ironically some of the poorest countries of the world have high fertility levels though it would be rational if they control it. The other side of the equation you know, one side is the impact of population growth on sustainable development. The other side of the equation is impact of sustainable development on population growth uh, in introductory courses on population uh, this is a, uh, also an important link uh, towards which it is important to draw students attention. That sustainable development strategies to affect population growth, what will be the advantages if we go for sustainable development? First health benefit, so, if we go for sustainable development the first benefit would be in terms of health benefit. Then it will make development more participatory, we will use more participatory approach, sustainable development has to use a participatory approach and so development processes become participatory. Sustainable development leads to justice and empowerment, social justice, women's empowerment, empowerment of the vulnerable sections. <coughs> By definition sustainable development is that uh, which brings the vulnerable, the marginal, the alienated to the mainstream. It uh, also develops a rational scientific view and empowerment of women and disadvantaged sections of society, improvement in governance. You cannot have sustainable development uh, if there is no corresponding improvement in governance and strengthening of legal framework. On the one hand uh, it is uh, important to focus on population growth processes, so that they can be altered to have sustainable development and on the other hand if you have sustainable development that will also be beneficial to implementation of population policy. This is what it means to uh, say that we must look at this link from both the sides. However, there are some unresolved questions. In literature on population role of demographic factors in development has been greatly explored, but the role of sustainable development in population management is less understood. Maybe students like you when you take up your MPhil and PhD research may take up some of these connections. In 1987 the World Commission on Environment and Development, the Brundtland Commission asked that all should keep in mind that sustainable economic growth and equitable access to resources are two of the most certain routes towards lower fertility rates. How? Think how this is the case. The state of world population 1993 has clearly demonstrated that more often than not international migration has been caused by environmental disruption. Sustainable development and environment planning therefore need control of migration. The link between environment and migration is not fully understood yet. Migration itself is more problematic than fertility and mortality and this link between migration and environment is the least understood component of uh, the population dynamics. Part of the difficulty in treating sustainable development as a determined determinant of demographic processes arises from the fact that there is no single blueprint of sustainability. Economic and social system differ widely among countries. Thus, although sustainable development has become a global objective, each nation will have to work out its own concrete policy. Also in the different regions of the world, the nature of population problems is different. The developed countries are in general characterized by low birth rate, low death rate, low infant mortality rate, below replacement fertility, near zero or negative growth rate, high percentage urban and the problem of population implosion. The less developed countries have just opposite of that. 
Several countries in both developed and less developed countries have unique demographic situation and they do not conform to the generalized pattern uh, which I mentioned just now. Sustainable development policies may have both desirable and undesirable consequences in both developed and developing countries. Uh, impact on economic growth is just one, there may be other impacts also. We have to explore what those impacts can be. Generalized connections may not exist and each country requires its own response to population processes as well as own strategies for sustainable development. Although there may be strong theoretical linkages between sustainable development and population, sustainable development is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition for effective population management and the reverse is equally true. You can have sustainable development with uh, low as well as high birth rate. Falling birth rates have also not been associated with better environmental management. So, there are many countries where birth rates are falling, but that does not uh, translate so well into climate policies or greenhouse gas emissions, it, which is today becoming more a factor of uh, the nature of technology that we use for productive process. It may be emphasized that both the developed and the less developed countries will have to work on sustainable development and population simultaneously. Uh, forgetting their differences and in this respect environmental networks and civil society actors and media and intellectual and networks of intellectuals, uh, social scientists, political scientists will have to play an important role. If we, if we leave uh, the environmental issues only to national governments and in traditional political frameworks, we cannot solve the global problem of environment and the differences of perceptions between developed and developing countries will remain. So, some uh, the environment problem is a new problem and this also re requires that we think in new ways to solve this problem at the global and micro level. Anything? Thank you.